Welcome to the Artist Academy podcast, a place where we focus on the business side of art to help you attract more customers, increase profits, and ultimately live a life of creativity and financial freedom. I'm your host, Andrea Earhart, and this week's episode features Australia-based figure artist Carmel Jenkin. Carmel has built her art business up to what most artists aspire to live up to one day, someone who creates from the heart rather than consistently running on the commission hamster wheel. Yep, she paints whatever she wants, and that happens to be a series of abstract female figures. Her unique niche has attracted the attention of multiple collectors, and she even did a pregnant woman series, which I was very intrigued by given my current status as a pregnant person (laughs) at the time of this interview. And Carmel shares how she built her art business around such an emotionally charged niche and her strategies for selling. You know, there's a lot of energy and knowledge that can come from someone like her who is currently in the thick of figuring out her methods through trial and error, all while having some big wins already along the way that she's about to share with you. So she's an open book about this crazy but fun art business roller coaster ride. So let me know what you think about this week's episode. Episode with Carmel Jenkin. Good morning. Hello. How are you? I am good. It is almost nighttime here. So yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good night. <laughs> and, I'm so um, excited to meet you. I've been listening to your podcast for so long, actually. You're one of the first ones I've listened to. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, thank yeah. you for telling me that. <laughs> so how did you get started as an artist? When did you get started? Like what year? And then where are you at now? And how did it all came to be? Okay. How long do you have? It's <laughs> it's almost a 28-year history. So I was one of those kids that was always good at art at school, like always had really good book presentation and everything. I wasn't sure that I wanted to be an artist until sort of maybe early teens when I was at high school because I went to a school that had a really good art program. And it just sort of fell into place. And I knew that from then on that I wanted to do art. And then I went through a stage of life that was quite hard. My mum was ill from, say, 1985 to 1992. My mum battled with cancer. So basically towards that late stage when I was in high school doing art and when she was really sick to the time that she passed, I was in high school when she passed, my art just sort of, amplified and excelled and it just became a coping mechanism for me as I say it just basically the very first painting I ever did was of my mum and I started doing collages of her and I was just drawing her on repeat and I just remember like I came from a really academic family all my brothers were really smart I've got three older brothers my dad was a teacher I wanted to be smart like I really really tried hard at school but Art was the only subject that was effortless for me, where I purely I had a pure love for it and enjoyment and something I could do and something that I did well at and I got good marks in. So after my mother had passed and I was doing images of her, it sort of I it cemented in my mind I knew that I wanted to be an artist. And it sort of grew from there. As soon as I left school, I was taken on by this art coordinator from my school who introduced me to these different gallery owners and I started exhibiting my work in buildings just when I finished school. So I started having mini shows in these exhibition buildings where all these accountants and solicitors went and my work would sell out there. So I had like this small beginning when I was like 16 years of age. And then I basically, I naturally, back then, we're talking about the late 90s. So this was 1993, 1994. 1995. And then I got into uni in 1996. Then I studied art for three years. But the thing was like, there wasn't really a profession to be an artist back then. Like it was super hard. You needed to be represented by a gallery. And my dad had always encouraged me to be an art teacher. And I knew in my heart that it's something that I didn't want to do because my dad was a teacher and he always seemed quite stressed. And my art teacher at school was super stressed and I just wanted to create. I didn't want to have to look after other people's art and then just sort of create art on the weekend. But going to art school, I mean, that was great. I mean, I feel like I didn't, I mean, there's pros and cons and I can talk about that with you later, but 
after art school, I then got gallery representation. I was quite lucky and just naturally had a few shows in Brisbane and in um, the Gold Coast. And then I actually went through a really tough stage in my life. I think I was still grieving. I was a little bit lost and I developed an eating disorder and I had that for about, say, four years and it was quite bad to the point I'd lost so much weight and I was living with my father in Brisbane and I was still producing art and actually my art had moved on from images of my mom, and then I just started drawing women and I was starting to draw women that were quite bony and they looked depressed and sad and they were quite emotive and basically art was the only thing that was sort of giving me control in my life and keeping me going and giving me purpose. And it was just interesting how I just went through all these different stages. And then after Art Uni and having my shows, and then when I became really sick, I decided that I needed to leave home in Brisbane and move to a new city because I wasn't getting better in Brisbane. And I wanted to live with my brother who lived interstate in Melbourne. So I basically left everything behind and started a new life in a new city and I actually stopped producing art for a little bit because it was just really hard. I mean, this was the year 2000 and it was just really hard to make it anywhere. I mean, Melbourne didn't know me as an artist and so I just had to start from scratch again and I I think I got a job in retail and Basically, I was walking around the city one day in Melbourne and I ran into an old boyfriend of mine from Brisbane and he actually had become an artist and he was represented by a really good gallery, which was like news to me. And he knew that I did art in Brisbane and he introduced me to his gallery owner and said, look, just maybe he'll like your work, give it a go. And I had an interview and he saw my work and he decided to give me an exhibition in Melbourne, which was really good because it was quite a prestigious gallery in Melbourne. So I got a leg in because back then there was no Instagram, there was no socials. I mean, I think there was a start of Facebook, but it was quite tough to get your work seen. I relied on the newspaper newspaper articles to get my work seen back then and word of mouth. So I ended up having three exhibitions with this gallery and it went quite well. The last one didn't do as well in 2009 and that was when Australia was going through a recession and then he decided no more shows. So I was sort of, oh, I don't know what to do again. I was like pivoting. I I wasn't represented by a gallery and it was 2009. I mean, there was, I think Instagram hadn't started yet. There was Facebook, but I was a little bit lost. And then I thought, okay, what am I going to do now? I have to do this on my own. So I decided to start a blog on Tumblr and then I was submitting my work to an online gallery called Daily Painters. I think it, it's cancelled out now, but basically I was just putting my work online and just hoping that someone would buy it. And I was doing it at way cheaper prices than the work it was priced at the exhibitions. But It was good because I didn't put my price on the thing. People just had to email me. So no one knew how much it was, but I was selling it at a cheaper price because I wanted more eyeballs to see my work. And I actually really liked blogging on Tumblr. That was just the era of blogging. And then I did that for a few years and then Instagram came and that basically changed my life. And then um, basically I was selling work off Instagram and Daily Painters eventually stopped. And I thought, oh, what am I going to do? And then I actually had my Tumblr blog taken down because they wrote to me and said a Russian spy had reblogged one of my works or some silly thing like that. But I think it was because of the community guidelines, because of the, because my work is basically, you know, I draw women that are naked in female form, but it's not sexual. It's more emotive, but it can be read differently by different people. So For some reason, my Tumblr blog that I worked so hard on was taken down and my website was attached to it. So basically, I only had Instagram and I was silly. I never organized a website for myself. I just was just selling work via Instagram. And then by 2019, so basically, I I was doing Instagram, Instagram from like 2014 to 2019. And then I decided, okay, I need to get myself together and get myself a website And I'm so grateful I did. I got a website done just before the pandemic hit. Okay, if I didn't do that, I just, I don't know. 
And then once the pandemic hit, everything changed for me again. So in a good way, I don't want to say that because I know it was a hard time for everyone, but in terms of my work being seen by the world, because then video just took over on Instagram, my work sort of exploded. My art had been the best it had ever been ever from even when I started, from when I was young, from when I was having the exhibitions. So during the pandemic was sort of the best time and leading up to where I am now. So basically still doing Instagram and yeah, you know, rolling with it, hustling, the videos, everything. So that's where I'm up to at this stage. Is that too long? <laughs> no, you're, that's great. Yeah. No, I tried to get 28 years down in a second, but you know, it's really hard to condense everything. I wish I had a shorter history, but you know, I am 45. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, the, the more the better, just to understand where you're coming from and where you're at now. So do you get the majority of your, do you do commissions or do you do your own paintings and people buy them? I definitely don't do commissions. I have in the past, reluctantly, my work is quite emotive. And basically when someone has asked me to do a piece for them and they've given me a photo or something, every time I have done something for them, because, you know, naturally when you start being an artist, you want to, I'm sort of a people pleaser essentially, and I want to make everyone happy. So I always have said yes. But when I attempted to do the work, I sort of struggled. And you can see the struggle in the work because my work is quite emotive and it's based on instinct. When I have an image to draw from, or when I have criteria from a client, it just sort of influences my mind and my work isn't free and it just doesn't come out the way it was. And also I've had some clients ask me to draw something that I've drawn previously to draw it again. And I've done it on two occasions. And one reason was a drawing I did got burnt down in a fire. There was a big bushfire in Australia and the client was miserable about it and wanted that piece again. So I was contacted and asked to draw that same piece again. And I could never get the same intensity as what I did the first time. So, but I did that piece for her. And there was another piece I did that it just, the client wasn't happy with it. And was sort of, we were back and fro. And after that, I just, I got it done. But after that, I decided no more commissions because my work is just Emotive base, if you want a piece of my work, just go to my website and have a look. Or if you see something on Instagram, you can DM me. So that's basically how I roll. Yeah. How was you mentioned whenever we first hopped on here before we started recording, you said that you were a night owl. So what does your day look like? Like how many hours do you spend painting? When do you paint? What's your schedule like? Okay. Yeah. Well, before child, <laughs> I've got a I've got a five-year-old. So before child, I used to paint late in the afternoon. I would consider myself, I draw more than I paint, definitely. And I would probably start late afternoon and then finish early evening. And then I would also do some work after dinner. And sometimes I would draw to one o'clock in the morning. That was before child. Now my day is completely different. If I could just run it by you pretty quickly, I wake up, get my kid ready for school, come home, make myself a cup of coffee, sit down on the couch behind me and I start batching content for reels because I need to get that out the way for the week because if I don't do that, I'll just be stressed because you know how video content is now being pushed on Instagram. So I didn't sort of have this extra work before because I actually preferred it when it was more of a photo platform. But as it's now a video platform, I'm just sort of batching real content for the week so I can get that out the way. And then after that, I go to gym. I have to work out every day, even if I get 20 minutes, just for my mental state and my physical state. It just makes me feel better, wakes me up. Once I get home from the gym, I start doing some videos and I, or I start doing a time lapse. I try to do one time lapse a week of me doing my art. And then that leads me up to three o'clock where I pick my kid up from school and then to bring her home and then spend time with the family. I post on Instagram later that night and then get everyone dinner. And then after dinner, when she goes to bed, I start doing my artwork. So I start probably doing my artwork from about say 9.30 to about 11.30 PM. And then I sort of chill out for a bit. I watch a little bit of Netflix. And then after Netflix, I'm still working. I actually go into Twitter and um, do something for the NFTs because I started 
doing that recently. Well, not recently, probably January this year I started. So there's a whole new community there. So, and they're sort of up at a different time than me. So I do that usually at about 12.30 p.m. And then I might get an image ready for known origin or open C. So see, to see how I'm going, I've slowed down a little bit in the NFT space, but yeah. So my whole day is, is full as such. Yeah. All the different things. I love that you're dabbling into NFTs. I also did at the beginning of the year and then I just got so busy with murals and having a baby. So we just... I know. (laughs) You're doing amazing. I know. And it's just for prioritizing everything. I love all your... I actually listen to all your podcasts on (laughs) NFTs and you being interviewed and it actually helped me quite a bit. There was a few things that you said that helped me a bit because you sort of started a little bit after me and you started right at the end of that gold rush. So you just got in. Yeah. There was an age that, yeah, and I got in just when it was good and then it just went super quiet and slowly it's building up again. But it's a whole different mentality and you've really got to, it's hard to divide your energies. You've got to prioritize. Like you said, I'm supposed to release two collections of artwork this year and I haven't because I'm also doing the NFTs. So I need to prioritize right now. And just as you're doing murals, I need to like, because I've got a collection of pregnant ladies drawings that I need to release. Someone asked me in January, when is it happening? I said, oh, this month. And it's now September. It's August. It's the last day of August here. So yeah, I've just, I don't know where this year has gone. I and I feel really bad because before NFTs, I was releasing two, three collections on my website a year. So I've, I sort of need to really prioritize my time and that's something that I'm not great at. So I need to work on that. Yeah. I think that's all of us really, because I tried to do it all at once and adding the NFTs in is really where I got overwhelmed. <laughs> and yeah. so I had to take a step back and I still think about it. I'm like, oh, I should really put something out because those people who bought my NFTs are probably like, where'd you go? And so I plan to sometime. You went quiet because it's a little bit apprehensive right now. Like you, it's just unpredictable. Yeah. I had a little bit of a boost lately because I, I only do one of ones on there. And then mm-hmm. I was encouraged to do editions. So I wasn't sure how I would go. So I did editions of a piece and then it brought attention to my one of ones. So sort of glad that I did it. So I sold two one of ones this week. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So it's, You're it's marketing it on Twitter. Yeah. I'm definitely not on discord or anything like that. I don't think I can allow extra, like I just joined TikTok for God's sake. <laughs> I, just, I, I said I would never join TikTok and <laughs> Actually, from listening to one of your videos and from listening to Gary V. Ellis, do you listen to Gary V? Yep. Yeah. He was the one that made me join TikTok and you. I was like, what am I doing? And actually, I didn't mind the process because at first I thought I would really not like it, but no one knew me on there. And like, I haven't told anyone from Instagram that I was on there. I just wanted to see how I would go with just being anonymous. And I just started and I sort of treated it like, a mini diary entry because I have so much video content from my reels on my phone that I thought, why not use it? And I just played with some of the videos in a different way. And it just became more like a diary, like writing in your diary. It was just, yeah, I don't know. I, I found it to be quite fun, but maybe it's because no one's there and I felt less pressure to do something well. So with Instagram, I feel I feel a little bit of pressure lately to, especially with reels, to just sort of create. Isn't creating a reel an art form within itself? Yep, it really is. Yeah, yeah, because there's certain projects that I haven't even posted because I know that it won't look that good in a reel, and so I'm like, eh. <laughs> but it was just crazy to think, you know. Yeah. Do you miss how Instagram was a photo platform? I really like video. So you really. Like- I, yeah, I love and hate it. You know, I think it was way easier back then, but I really like video and doing and creating a video and learning what keeps someone's attention. And the thing is, I know what will keep someone's attention. And so I just can't bring myself to post the other stuff. I'm like, no. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sort of, I think I liked it when it was sort of, when they still gave attention to photo posts and it was sort of evenly displaced, but now it's just sort of, now when I post a photo, it doesn't have that same reach. And sometimes yeah. concerned that the people that 
used to follow me or, or that do follow me that sort of expect the same sort of photos from me and they're not seeing it anymore. And now it's just racy, very racy. And especially if your client is a little bit older, they sort of, a lot of people still prefer a still. So I'm actually thinking of moving as well. And I, I can't believe I'd enter another social media app, but um, I'm thinking of um, joining Vero. So have you heard of Vero? No. It's just a photo app that a lot of photographers and artists have moved to that are quite especially for artists that are introverted and just want to do photos. So it's just like the old Instagram. So it's been getting a lot of reach lately. It it exploded like four years ago and now it's exploding again because people are just over the raciness of reels all the time and not having a platform where you could actually see what you want to see. Yeah. Huh. Okay. I might look into that today. Maybe. I don't know. I just started uploading stuff to YouTube shorts. Oh, you don't... Yeah, well, yeah, just just the shorts though, because I I post the like the podcast episodes on YouTube, and the, there's okay. not it not a huge reach on there. I don't, I really don't pay much attention to YouTube. It's been on my list for a long time to create like tutorials and whatnot and put it on there. But they have this new YouTube Shorts, and it's just like Reels. So I'm just reposting it onto YouTube Shorts, and yeah. just just to see what happens. And if you so re- far, nothing crazy. That's super good if you can just repurpose content you already have. So it's just super easy. Yeah. So back on this NFT thing really quick. So where have you found success with this? Like where are your customers coming from that are buying? Like, so Twitter, but specifically? Okay. Well, how I got into it basically was through Instagram. I had a friend that we sort of started at the same time and she's got, her name's Jillian Suzanne. She does really beautiful work. And uh, I noticed she was like, oh, I sold this. I sold that every post. I sold this NFT, sold that NFT. And I heard NFT is being spoken about on a couple of different podcasts, but I was like, what the hell is that? Like, I don't get it. I don't understand it. I mean, my work doesn't move. How do you digitize your work? And um, basically I said, can you help me with this? And she said she was more than happy to help me. So she mentored me through the whole process. She lives in Los Angeles. So basically we were like, what's up each other every day. And she talked me through the whole process. I just, I still don't understand it, to be honest. A hundred percent. I still keep, I just accidentally bought two NFTs. I was going to buy one, but I bought two editions of the same person, exactly the same twice. So I'm just making silly mistakes the whole way. Anyway, my friend, Julian Suzanne brought me into it because she was selling really well. She said, you know, see how you go, just give it a go. And she mentored me. And basically she said, just start your Twitter. And I already had a Twitter account, which I sort of abandoned. So I probably started it years ago. I was tweeting and then I just didn't have enough energy for another platform. So I stopped. And then she said, just start your Twitter again and then post the image that you want to post. And it was OpenSea. I mean, that's the first one usually everyone starts at. So Me too. Yeah. So I just posted my image on Twitter and I only had, say, 200 followers on Twitter at the time, but they were just people that followed me from years ago. And so it was dead. And she basically had retweeted my post and for some reason I did post a little bit on Instagram about it. I was a little bit unsure because obviously my followers on Instagram are most of them are artists, I think. And a lot of artists are a little bit resistant towards NFTs or just a bit apprehensive, which I sort of understand. And I never wanted to push that on them. But when I was entering the NFT world, I just still wanted to let them know softly that I was doing it. So I sort of promoted it a little bit on Instagram. And then some of those people followed me on Twitter that were doing it themselves, but I only did that for a little bit. And then I stopped. And then I sort of had engaged enough. I was tweeting every night and not just about NFTs. I was just tweeting about different things with my art, just coming up with sort of clever captions and not too many hashtags. And now sometimes I don't do hashtags, but I basically get retweeted by artists that were already within the space that were doing well. And I just really liked the community. I felt like I was part of something. Everyone was really, really supportive and everyone was building each other up. And I've grown, I'm nearly, I think I'm like 1,800 followers now on Twitter. Not that the following counts, but basically when you get retweeted by another artist on there that's doing NFTs, then their collectors basically see your work as well. And if they like you, they'll follow you. And then the first NFT I put up, it sold within a second, but 
my friend bought it. So that was really nice of her. And then it, for me, the test was the second NFT, if someone was going to buy it that I didn't know. And yeah, someone bought it that I didn't know and um, straight away within a second. And then the second and the third, same thing. It was gone within a second. I was like, what is going on? This is amazing. I think you experienced the same thing. Like, yeah. This, yeah. And I just had got in at that January, just at towards the end of that gold rush. So basically I sold out the first 20 pieces I did. So I put them on there and they went, and then it started to taper. It started to slow down towards May, I think March, April, maybe April, May, June. So I was doing one or two NFTs a week and I'd sold them straight away. And then I got taken by Known Origin. They accepted me and I put my work on Known Origin. So I've sold so far nine pieces on Known Origin and about over 20 pieces on OpenSea. And then this week I sold two, but it's slowed down a lot. There are pieces I haven't sold since say May, June, just, yeah, just, I don't know. How much are you selling them for? I started at 0.10 ETH and then I moved up to 0.15. And then I haven't moved up from 0.15, that price. I'm just sort of keeping it there. I love that because you sold so many and you're not getting greedy with it. You're really just like, okay, this price is working. You've moved up just a little bit and you're, you're using a price that you're selling at because I'm seeing a lot of times when new artists come in, they'll list their first one for one ETH or, you know, 0.5 or something. And it's like, I was, I was (laughs) the whole way by my friend because she went through the whole process and I was really listening to her and I'm, I'm definitely not greedy. It's like, it's like when I was reselling my art on Daily Painters, I went down from, I used to sell my artwork, my drawings for 1400 at my exhibit. But when I started on Daily Painters, I was selling them unframed for 350 each when I first started. And that's like, so I went down a lot and I just, every year I built up a little bit, but not too much. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like that's just how it is with in the real world with NFTs and paintings. You just, you start at one price and then you slowly build up. There's no like magical, like nobody comes in and lists their stuff for $10,000 and they just sell. Like it's definitely a stepping process. Yeah. I think the real challenge for me has been, what do I do with the piece that the NFT has sold and I've got the original artwork and how do I market that when my Instagram community is a bit, I'm not sure how they would feel about that. So because it's completely different thing. The original artwork is completely different to the digital image. And it's really hard for people to comprehend that. So I've got all these pieces that I want to sell that are original and I'd like to do a collection of them. But I also need to let everyone know, well, the NFT digital image of it has sold, but the original version is yours if you want it. But it's like, yeah, I have to work out how to market that eventually. Well, I think that most of the people that are on Instagram, the majority are don't even still know what an NFT is. And so yeah. I don't even think, I think you might get one or two people being like inquiring about the NFT and the original together, but the majority of our followers are not going to care. So I say like, don't like just market it as an original painting. And I wouldn't even mention yeah. NFT. Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. I needed to hear that because I've always been a bit, yeah, not sure how to yeah. be able to bring the worlds together, but I see some other artists can, but yeah, it's just been hard to bring the worlds together. But you know, you got to pivot. You got to, you know, I never even said I'd join Instagram, but I joined Instagram. Never said I do NFTs. I'm doing NFTs. I never said I joined TikTok. I'm doing TikTok. So <laughs> yeah. Yep. And I love that you're just, you're open and you're trying everything. And I think it doesn't matter what age, you know, to like, it's, I mean, you don't have to be a kid on to get a TikTok and you don't have to be at this for a really long time to have your stuff in a gallery. Like it's just, it's, there's this happy medium of just people that are open to, Hey, I'm going to try this weird NFT things. And it's so cool that it's working for you. And you're finding buyers mostly on Twitter, you said? For my NFTs, yeah, mainly on Twitter. I haven't really found... There were a couple of people that had followed me on Instagram for years that had bought an NFT. Same. But not... Yeah, not really. Yeah, and I don't market myself enough. I don't know why I did and then I stopped because I just felt like I was not... I don't know. I just felt like they didn't want to hear about it. So, yeah. But then Uh, I was... I have this draft in my phone, this reel that, you know, that 
it's like an NFT you can hold. Everyone has been, and I, I, I've been wanting to post it, but then I just post it. Yeah, I know I should. I've got so many drafts in my reels that I just haven't posted yet. I don't know why, but yeah, it would be <laughs> like that. eventually, eventually. But I just, I mean, once Instagram starts doing NFTs, I think a lot of artists that said they would never do it will probably start doing it. It's like how artists don't want to do reels and they're forced to do reels. So when the world <laughs> pivots, you know, you sort of have to move with it. Otherwise it's not that you're left behind, but it's just, you know, but then again, there's apps like Vero that you can do if you, if you want a quiet life. So. <laughs> yeah. But I think, yeah, I think doing what you're doing and just keeping an open mind and being at the forefront of all of this, like once Instagram does come out with an easier buying method of NFTs, we're going to be way ahead of everybody who yeah. was like, ah, I don't know about yeah, that. I want it- I wanted to be way ahead because I always felt like I always started a little, like I started the NFT a little bit late and I started Instagram a little bit later than I should have. So it's like, I just wanted to be, now I know that I've got to jump in straight, like even TikTok, I started too late. So if I jumped in during the pandemic, then, you know, I would have had a better following. But anyway, it's all good. It's all good. It's all learning. Yeah, I mean, it's all good. I mean, it, it's hard to divide your time with all this social. I mean, I have to be honest with you. It's, this is really crazy, but I actually get most of my customers from Pinterest and it's an app that I hardly even work at. I totally do nothing. It's absolutely crazy. And I need to set aside time to work on my Pinterest because when I look at my analytics on my website, it's Pinterest more than Instagram. It's just oh my absolutely- gosh. And I don't do anything. I don't, yeah, I hardly ever post on there. I just because by the time I've done all my Instagram and Twitter stuff, I don't have enough time in the day to do another social media app. So yeah, it sort of builds within itself. So yeah, I'd say work on your Pinterest if you don't want to do Instagram or yeah, because people still appreciate stills. They love stills, you know, especially for wanting to see how art looks in a home. Man, (laughs) Pinterest. Yeah, I've been throwing stuff on Pinterest for a while and I get a little bit of traction from there, but it's not anything crazy because most of my stuff comes from Instagram or Facebook. But good to know that Pinterest is still doing its thing. (laughs) Yeah, I was shocked by that. Believe me. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. Well, do you have any more bits of advice for people? Basically, how to sell artwork. That's what people are listening to this. They're like, how do I sell my artwork? (laughs) I mean, you don't have to take my advice, but what I would do is I would create as much art as possible and you sort of to find your style that you really, that you know works for you and that when you produce enough art and I'm talking good art, bad art, and then you find your own style and once you find your own style, then you create a body of work. I would say first and foremost, get a website together before doing social media. So I did it the other way around and I just wasn't organized. And once I had my website together and I had my body of work, then everything just happened for me a bit more easily. So I just wish that I had my website a bit earlier. So basically I think just it's most important to have a body of work and to just create as much as possible, trust yourself, lose yourself, have those frustrated nights, have those good nights and also If you, you know, basically I I would say Instagram is where it's at. I mean, say good things about it, say bad things about it, but I think that is the social media platform for artists and get on Instagram and do as much videos as possible. And even if you're introverted, there are ways that you can post photos on reels instead of doing a video of yourself. And you, there are ways of doing it where you don't have to put yourself on camera. So post as many reels as possible and still have still photos as well combined with it. And I would also say TikTok as well, but you know, it's a lot. (laughs) It's a lot. Yeah. (laughs) Awesome. Okay. So just get your shit together is what I'm hearing (laughs) and get your stuff on a website and then start posting to social media. And yeah, well, you sound like you've got it pretty figured out and the best way that we can all kind of just figure it out. And thank you so much for coming on and sharing your stories and everything. Thank you so much for having me. So it's an absolute pleasure. And I love talking to you. You're so easy to talk to. So yeah, (laughs) Yeah, same. So 
you're doing really good. I love all your posts with your belly. It looks gorgeous. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I love being pregnant. Oh yeah. I love it. It's just a, a long time to do the thing. Yeah. It's been pretty easy and fun so far, but yeah. The, thank you for the compliments and yeah, we will keep in touch on Instagram. Okay. We'll do. We'll do. And that's a wrap. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Artist Academy podcast. And if you like hearing interviews just like this in your ear, if they inspire you, then I want to encourage you to go download the audible version of my new book, Mural Money. It's a condensed version of basically all of the best of the best tips given here on the podcast from guests, plus my own words of wisdom to help you get started in any art industry, plus stories of some hard lessons learned that I have never told before. You can pick up a copy at muralmoney.com. And again, I highly recommend the Audible version. I put a lot of tender love and care to make sure the Audible was extra special. It had some extra goodness in there. And it's really for any artist, but especially those wanting to make a profit from a paintbrush. Muralmoney.com. That's it. I'll see you next week.